Good morning, everyone. I hope you had a good sleep and you're in a good shape for this uh, last day of presentation. Um, I would like to give a, a small introduction to the Hammer, uh, which happened last week, so it was on Friday and th Saturday. So Hammer is um, the Hacking Audio and Music Research uh, Hackathon, and it was held at the Deezer office um, this year. So um, last week was more uh, than 50 participants uh, which are most of them attending uh, the Izmir conference. Uh, 11 projects were submitted, and uh, they are public, actually. It's public code and documentation that you can see on our um, public um, uh, Deezer GitHub. Um, we gave uh, four, uh, four prizes, and actually three of them are popular prizes, so it's uh, the contestants um, which were voting at the end of the day for... Uh, for the best projects and, and actually the best code, the best uh, documentation, and the best research project. And one additional prize was given by a Deezer jury uh, for um, the best music streaming um, project. And the first uh, prize, which is the best documentation, uh, went to the project Neural Bubble Beat. And uh, I will uh, leave uh, this podium. Florian presenting the project. Okay, hello. <laughs> hello, everybody. So on behalf of our team, consisting of Philip, Matthias, Rich, and myself, I'm going to present you our little project for this year's Hammer, which we called the Neural Bubble Beat. And our idea was to create a visualization that is synchronized to music, and that also allows us to interpret what a neural network does when it processes music. And our main components are a downbeat tracking RNN and a transcription network. And from the Trump transcription network, we take the hidden activations, cluster them according to the activity, and move those into, the, into those four corners here. And each activation will be represented by a single pixel, and those pixels um, will then control the background lightness. And from the last recurrent layer of the bit tracking RNN, we take each um, neuron and create one of those bubbles or particles here. And those, um, oh, wrong direction, sorry. And the hidden activations of those units will then be interpreted as electrical charges. And we use those charges to simulate a particle movement according to Coulomb's law, which you see here with this formula. And this basically just means that um, charges which have um, um, different polarization are going to attract each other, and charges with same polarization are going to um, push each other away. And yeah, the color just represents the, um, uh, the polarization of the charge. So red means positive, blue means negative and the particle size is um, roughly proportional to the activation magnitude. Yeah, you can find the code here, and I will show you just a quick demo video in the wrong direction. So um, in the video, you will see that some of those bubbles here are really um, moving according to the beat, so they change their polarity, and you might also be able to see some patterns if you stare long enough, but overall, you might not get too much out of it, but it looks kind of cool, so I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for attention and thanks to Deezer for hosting this this year's Hammer. Yeah. Thank you very much. The following, sorry, the following prize went to uh, the best code, and that's Chris for Face Jam. Thanks a lot. Yes, I'm Chris Traley. Uh, my goal was to create a program that would, and so given a picture of somebody somebody's face in a song, to have the face raise the eyebrows to the beat, and then have the face change expressions based on where you are in the song. And so thanks Hammer, because they actually 
that's what I said I was going to do, and they held me accountable, so it happened. So here's what that ended up looking like, and you can see the code at the following link. <laughs> so notice now, it's gone into a different section, so he's smiling. <laughs> And actually, there's some recurrence within this section, so he changes his expression a little bit, and the repetitions within the chorus. Okay, so that's that. So how did I actually do that? So, the first step was to get that whole expression stuff under control. So the main way I did that was I used a, a library called Dlib to extract these facial landmarks. These are key points on the face, around the eyebrows, nose, mouth, etc. Um, and then I did a Delaunay triangulation on this, and the point of this was, if I can figure out where the landmarks go, I want to extend that map to the rest of the face and come up with a warp over all the pixels. And so, so the, that was the first step, which took a little bit longer than I expected, but, but I knew it was working when I could do this. Okay, so randomly perturb the facial landmarks <laughs> and get the face to change. Um, and I could have just stopped there, you know, made it a random thing, but I actually wanted to do something real with expression. So what I did next was I took a video of myself making a bunch of different faces, which I'll show you in a moment, and then essentially did PCA on the landmarks to learn sort of a space of facial expressions, a lower dimensional space of, of expressions, and then um, I was able to transfer those expressions onto the rock, okay, onto Dwayne Johnson. So you can see here's the first principal component of, of my expression, second principal component, third principal component, and you can see that they actually did transfer to the rock. Um, and so here's just a fun video of me <laughs> using this to, I guess you could say this is called facial expression cloning, okay, so. This was a fun outcome that I was able to actually sort of <laughs> treat Rock as my own little puppet. <laughs> so, um, there we go. So that there's code for that too, and it's all documented. Um, so if you'd like to animate the Rock, feel free. And then the last step, which this is sort of a plug for my late-breaking demo, um, I used some structure space of the song. Um, to actually move in the PCA space. So this is like a space of, of indicator functions of roughly where, you, you know, different sections in the song. Okay, so <laughs> I will end on this final demo, exclusive Ismir demo, because I took it down from YouTube. Thank you, Chris. Congratulations. Uh, the next prize uh, was the best research idea, and it went to the Project Meter Anomaly. And I'm calling, uh, um, is it Jordan? Yeah. Jordan. Hi. Um, Yes, so uh, at the hackathon, I worked with Romain Henneken and Olivier Lartio on modeling meter changes, which is to say we were interested in detecting changes in time signature. Uh, time signature changes are unusual in music, um, and so we often make a constant time signature assumption when we're doing downbeat tracking, but unusual does not equal rare. Uh, so for example, uh, almost a third of the Beatles songs that we had beat annotations for, we could see had non-uniform bar lengths. So they're unusual, but they are fun to uh, listen to and discover. Uh, here's a, a fun example from a guilty pleasure of mine. This is gonna count the meters. So you can see there's this random bar in the middle that it only has three beats. The whole rest of the song is in 4-4, four, four, and there's just these two bars uh, in, at different points of the song that are in three. So can we try to detect that? So if this was the song and we made a constant downbeat uh, assumption, we would have uh, bars, bar estimations that get out of phase with themselves. Uh, and this was what we based our uh, method on. The idea was to use the self-similarity matrix, surprise, uh, to find points where the bar patterns get out of phase. So, <clears throat> if the, 
Yeah, so there's these two points where they get out of phase, and it turns out that by comparing the downbeat detection function for all of the bars, using the constant downbeat assumption, you'll find these phase changes as corners in uh, the self-similarity matrix. Um, and you can also find, if you compare the assumption, compare the uh, downbeats using different phases, you can find uh, the dissimilar sections that are related to each other with a phase change. So this is uh, uh, exciting. Um, we can also find uh, bad time signature assumptions when there are missing diagonal blocks. So this is a song that's in 4-4 but has an entire middle section in 3-4, not just a single bar that gets you out of phase. Uh, so the findings were that uh, self-similar matrices of downbeat detection functions can highlight time signature changes and, well, I think I should move on maybe. Or, I, I, you have 30 I have 30 seconds, okay. Uh, we looked at a couple ideas for fixing the downbeats actually once we have these, uh, including testing with several time signature assumptions and then uh, using the blockiness of the SSMs to get the actual local meter and using heuristics to decode the downbeat detection function differently. Um, the downbeats were coming from Mad Mom and actually the downbeat detection function is really good, uh, we just need to decode it better. Um, and you can, yeah, you can look at our GitHub, so thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, the last project is for the best uh, music streaming service uh, project, and it went to the Music Taste Analysis Project, and I'm calling Philip to talk about it. Hello, everybody. And I'm, uh, my name is Philip, and I'm going to present the project that is a very long title, Quantification of Subjective Taste in Neural Network-Based Music Preference Predictions. Uh, so the main idea is that we wanted kind of to try to quantify the user taste and the uh, uh, motivation behind that, that uh, users might like the same song but for different reasons. For example, one person might like the beat and rhythm and another person might like the timbral structure of the song. And if you just use the a typical music similarity, it is not working very well in the differentiating those things. And also another uh, example is that uh, some users just like one, like one song from the album but don't like the rest of the album. Why? So uh, our solution was to use the transfer learning from the uh, classifiers and auto taggers uh, that had been pre-trained already. So we use the models that have been trained for their respective uh, for their respective objectives and use the uh, activations of uh, either the topmost hidden layer or all of the hidden layers as an input for another neural net that is fully connected and uses those as an input and tries to predict the rating of the user to the song. Zero if they don't like it, one if they like it. And the idea is that those activations kind of represent the taste and the neural net, uh, the second neural net, kind of uses the taste as an input and uh, produces the uh, pr uh, score predictions as an output. So uh, in the scope of the hackathon, we did two simple experiments. Uh, the first one is uh, we had a system that you input 10 songs that you want to represent your taste, and we calculate the statistics uh, according to these six dimensions, uh, densibility, acousticness, energy, valence, liveness, and instrumentalness. Uh, and uh, we, the idea is that lower variance means that users are more particular and have lower total tolerance to that dimension. So for example, uh, I have inputted a lot of uh, rock and metal and alternative rock songs, and you see as they're in the red rectangle that the lowest, uh, the lowest variance is for the densibility and acousticness with very low means. Kind of makes sense, but in the other uh, dimensions, you see that the variance is pretty big. Uh, Mm -hmm. And the second experiment that we did was basically to implement the very simple neural net that was trained on the uh, likes and dislikes of one user and was predicting if the user would like some song that is not in the data set and it kind of worked and it was fun to uh, listen to the songs when the neural net says like it is 90% that you will like it. And that's pretty much it. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much. Um, that was it. So that was the hackathon last uh, week. And uh, just to remind you, it was two days. So it's, I think it's uh, quite impressive what you did, guys, during these two, day, two days. Uh, congratulations again. And uh, thank you. Have a very good day. Good morning. So this begins session E on timbre tagging, similarity patterns, and alignment. And presenting the first paper is uh, Iris Jen. Welcome. She is discussing her paper, Analysis by Classification, a Comparative Study of Annotated and Algorithmically Extracted Patterns in Symbolic Music. Oh, hi. Hello. Uh, I'm Iris Yuping Ren. Uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about comparing human annotated... Oh, that's not... Okay, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, comparing human annotated and algorithmically extracted musical patterns. Uh, this is a joint work with my supervisors, Anya Fook, uh, Walter Svestra, and Remco Welcome um, at U Utrecht University. So first, what are musical patterns? Um, patterns in music can be described in many ways. For example, in a loose way, we can make combinations of nouns and adjectives and uh, describe it such as characteristic accepts, uh, special musical ideas, and we also have different terminologies for patterns in different corpora and genres. We call them sequence motif licks. Um, and in this work, we take musical patterns as uh, salient passages that repeatedly appear in music. Um, like many other fields, uh, pattern discovery can be very helpful in many MRR tasks and music activities, such as error detection, segmentation, classification. We also have uh, many previous research on this topic, uh, including uh, Mirex uh, discovery of um, themes and section tasks um, that algorithm have been making progress. Um, but to see how we can further improve algorithms in this domain, uh, we, um, in this paper, use a different data set, uh, the Mitch's tune collections, which has melodic patterns annotated by experts. Um, and we take seven state-of-the-art algorithms um, and compare uh, the human annotations with algorithmically, algorithmically extracted patterns. Um, so uh, at the same time, we're also interested in how the elements of randomness plays a role in here. So we take uh, random excerpts um, and um, compose these three sets of patterns, uh, the random baseline, human annotations, and algorithmic output. Um, so now we have uh, three sets of different patterns. Uh, we uh, put them. Uh, into a feature extraction toolbox presented yesterday, J Symbolic 2. Um, and uh, in this feature extraction process, we extract features such as note density, average note duration, uh, most common pitch class, um, etc. And we hope by comparing and analyzing these pattern features, we can find out more about whether there are symmetric group differences. Um, and what those group differences can tell us about the differences in human annotations, algorithm output, and random accepts. Um, so um, the way we compare and analyze uh, those pattern sets are using classifiers. So um, we use six well-known classification algorithms to classify and see which features play an important role in telling us the group differences. Um, so let's imagine a few possible outcomes. A nice one would be such as this, that we have um, lots of uh, overlaps between algorithmic output and annotations, while the random uh, axes are quite distance from this group. And if we have results like this, like the algorithm are very close to the random output, and the annotations are not having overlap with them, that would be bad. Um, and how would one interpret uh, instances such as this when they're quite separate from each other? Um, so come to our poster and have some discussion and find out about results. Thank you.
Okay, paper E2 is presented by Christopher Finkensieb. Welcome. He will be presenting generalized skip grams for pattern discovery in polyphonic streams. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about skip grams and why they are useful. So this is a problem. When you're working with symbolic representations of music, you're most of the time interested in at least two dimensions, namely pitch and time. But when you look at um, actual um, polyphonic piece, it doesn't really have a nice regular structure in either of these dimensions. So what you usually do is either you apply some kind of slicing, which gives you a nice vertical structure within each slice and a nice horizontal structure across the slices, or you just restrict yourself to some form of monophony either strictly monophonic voices or just a single melody. So while monophony is uh, clearly a restriction because you're losing generality, um, slicing is also a bit problematic because first of all, you're cutting your notes into several pieces and depending on your problem, you might have to count for that. Um, and uh, moreover, you have many vertical structures in music like broken chords, um, which don't even occur sing uh, simultaneously, so you won't find them in a single slice. So what we propose is um, a new solution to this approach based on skip grams. So skip grams are already used in linguistics and they work a bit like this. So you have a sequence of items and you select subsequences, which may have a limited amount of gaps in between. So um, you can see them as like a generalization of n-grams. Um, so what we did is to generalize this idea of skips and instead of just counting the gaps between the, your items, you're basically able to define an arbitrary function that measures the distance between two items. If you do this, um, your things get a lot easier because you don't need to require a strict sequence of items, but they can have a weird structure like music. Um, so in this, this example, we chose the skip function to be the distance between the onsets of several nodes. And as you can see, we don't need to have them in a sequence anymore, but um, we can pick out nodes freely as long as they are in, within a certain time range. So why is this useful to describe horizontal and vertical structures? So if you wanna um, have vertical structures, it's very simple, you basically just do the thing that I just showed. So uh, you take the onset distance as a skip function, um, and then this will give you collections of nodes that are within a certain time frame. So they are kind of vertical, but as you can see in this example, they don't need to be simultaneously. So this is what would not be possible with slicing. For horizontal structures, it's very similar. Um, you can also take the uh, onset distance as a skip function, um, but you might want to add a, an additional condition that nodes are not allowed to overlap so that they are actually sequential in the music. Um, so one more thing that you can do is to, uh, if you want to have both a vertical and horizontal structure, is that you apply your skip grams recursively. So first you generate vertical structures um, as skip grams over the nodes, and then you take these vertical structures um, do an additional pass of skip grams, and this generates you the sequences of these vertical structures, so you get a horizontal structure. It's kind of a nested structure that is similar to, um, to the slices, but as opposed to slices, you can have non-simultaneity, and you don't uh, cut your notes in the middle. Uh, so if after seeing this, you still can't figure out why this is useful, um, you know where to find me later. So thanks for your attention, and have a nice day. Paper E3 is presented by Igor Vatolkin. Welcome. People presenting comparison of audio features for recognition of Western and ethnic instruments in polyphonic mixtures. So, good morning and welcome to my talk. So what's the motivation? So a lot of work was done in recent years on instrument recognition. For example, starting with instrument samples, going to monophonic phrases, and also to polyphonic recordings. But many studies are restricted to Western world. 
also recently, in some years, there are more studies on recognition of ethnic samples, and it's quite good, so it can extend our research. But the problem is that uh, it is very hard to find a work which combines both worlds. You just try to investigate features and classification models, which will try to do the best to combine some Western recordings and also some ethnic recordings. So in my uh, work, I try to identify features which are very well good, suited to classify Western recordings, but also to classify ethnic samples. And uh, another idea is how can we identify the best features which are suitable for both worlds. So going to database, how does it sound? So these are the three examples. Uh, as we see, I use a combined samples. It's an artificial database, but then I can be sure which instruments are playing there. And these are three to four tones combined from Western and ethnic samples. And uh, the Western samples are from Moon's database, RBC and University of Iowa samples, and another one from Ethno Vault collection from Best Surveys. And the task is to identify eight different classification, uh, eight, eight different Western instruments and 12 different ethnic instruments. Uh, the feature sets, so I do not use deep learning now, but a good set of old handcrafted audio features, so the number of dimensions is quite high, almost 800. So it's also reasoned because I save each feature separately for the middle of the attack phase, for the onset frame, and the middle of the release phase. And uh, these are very different features, so you can see the paper and the poster for further information. How can I identify the most relevant features? So I apply two feature selection methods. One is the minimum redundancy maximal relevance, so I want to maximize uh, the correlation between the feature and the target and minimize the correlation between features. And I apply also a multi-objective evolutionary feature selection, so that means I try to reduce the number of features and also to reduce the error. And the overall proposal, how does it work? So to measure the relevance of features, to rank the features for, for their goodness to identify either Western or ethnic samples is to first apply this multi-objective feature selection. And then I uh, have the so-called non-dominated front. And I'm interested in all feature sets in this front because on the bottom right side, I have the feature set which has very few features with the largest error, but these features may be the most relevant. So if you want to minimize the number of features, these are the features which can be very helpful, only a couple of them. Then on the other side, on the upper left corner, I have the features which contribute to the best feature sets with the smallest error. So these features are also interesting. And what I propose, it's a very simple measure just to count the share of features across this complete non-dominated set to measure the relevance. And in the post, uh, in, in the paper, I provide some analysis of the experiments, for example, searching for features which are best suited for identification of individual categories, so see the paper, then for the best features for Western and ethnic categories, and also for the best compromise features for all categories. So I hope we see us at the poster. Thank you. Paper E4 is presented by Takumi Takahashi. Welcome. The paper is titled Instru Dive, a music visualization system based on automatically recognized instrumentation. Hello, every music lovers. Uh, I talk about InstruDive. This is a music visualization system for music uh, discovery using instrumentation. When you want to find music, genre categories are not enough. For example, if you want to find music with electric guitar and piano, the specifying rock music is ambiguous. Instrumentation is useful for you to specify your preference in such a situation. And so we proposed InstruDive system to help people discover music in, uh, based on instrumentation. The system automatically recognizes the instrumentation of uh, a musical piece 
and visualizes it as a multicolored pie chart. And the color corresponds to each instrument. And by using the pie chart, uh, the InstuDive interface enables users to uh, this, uh, enables instrument-based music discovery. I introduce the interface. Similar pie charts are located close to each other in two ways, circular and scattering. The visual player on the bottom visualizes the temporal changes instrumentation. It has piano and voice, and it can scroll and skip it. And it helps, for example, anticipate a significant change in instrumentation. On the left side, the search function retrieves pieces by a pie chart query. The results are instantly added to the playlist on the right side. The retrieved pieces have instrumentation that is similar to the query. The red acoustic guitar and blue violin. A musical piece disappears from the playlist. It disappears, 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 and uh, and if no piece is in the playlist, the next piece uh, is selected automatically. In a clockwise player, pieces are played in clockwise order so that the instrumentation gradually changes. And with a shuffle player, pieces are played randomly and they have different instrumentation. InstaDive helps smooth the transition between active and passive listening states. The visual, uh, visualized instrumentation helps discover music actively, and autoplay helps passively choose next pieces. Yes, the uh, instrumentation is analyzed by convolutional neural network. It does instrument recognition task for a one second spectrogram in all uh, audio mixture. This is the proposed model. The input is input is a, a spectrogram, and the output is output is a 11-dimensional vector. That is the activations of instrument, and the point is each convolutional filter that is unidirectional along frequency or time axis. We compare the performance with three other studies, and the result is. I was especially good in F macro. This means our model is powerful in dealing with various kinds of instruments. Uh, we summarize our research as two contributions, the interface and the CNN model. Thank you very much. Paper E5 is presented by Siddharth Gururani. Welcome. The paper is titled Instrument Activity Detection in Polyphonic Music Using Deep Neural Networks. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Siddharth Gururani, and I'm going to be presenting my work done at Georgia Tech in collaboration with Grace Note. Um, so uh, Takumi did a good job of showing you a visualization of what an instrument activity system would look like. It was at the bottom half of his interface. This is a much simpler uh, uh, visualization where you have the instruments and the activity across the track. Um, so some of the challenges uh, in an instrument uh, activity detection system would be, one is that the data set, so IRMAS is a very popular data set for polyphonic instrument recognition, uh, but the issue is that it has usually a single instrument tag with the one instance, and models may be unable to disambiguate between the sounds. Um, and the other is, is that evaluation of an instrument activity detection system is not possible because they're weakly labeled uh, instances. The other issue is metrics. So F measure is a very popular metric in instrument recognition as, as, as was shown in Takumi's talk as well, um, but it's threshold dependent. And I'll discuss the metrics that we use in our system later on. So to solve the data set issue, we make use of multi-track data sets. It's very useful for instrument activity because you can automatically obtain the annotations using the stems. Uh, we use a combination of the MedleyDB and the Mixing Secrets dataset. 
this is a very simple overview of our system. Um, so we have a pre-processing step, uh, the DNN training and the testing uh, and the prediction step, and a post-processing where we do temporal aggregation. I'll go over these one by one. So in pre-processing, we first use data augmentation by pitch shifting uh, all the tracks. Um, then we also use one second clips and mass spectrograms as the input for the, uh, for the DNNs. We compare three different models. Uh, one is a baseline multilayer perceptron. We have a convolutional neural network and a convolutional recurrent neural network. Uh, the architectures are based on previous work for instrument recognition and automatic tagging. Um, so for post-processing, um, so our network outputs an activity uh, for every second of the track. We want to evaluate the performance of the models for different uh, time scales. So what we do is we max pool uh, non-overlapping uh, outputs uh, to obtain those, and we evaluate for one second, five seconds, 10 seconds, and on the track level. So for our evaluation metrics, we make use of uh, popular multi-class, multi-label classification metrics. Um, we use AUC uh, because it's threshold agnostic and it's also robust against class imbalance. And we use the label ranking average precision, um, which measures how well your model is able to rank the true labels. We also come up with a visualization method for confusion in the multi-label classification setting. It's not very straightforward to build a confusion matrix here. So how we describe confusion is uh, given a false positive for an instrument, what is the distribution of the false negatives given that instrument? So uh, for example, over here I have the row for the distorted electric guitar, and it shows that there's confusion with, uh, it has high values for the acoustic guitar, the clean guitar, and the synth, which is very common. Um, for the results, we, uh, so this is like a very, uh, this is a very high level summary of the results. So the CNN and the CRNN outperform the, the multilayer perceptron, which is expected. And our model also performs well for minority instruments as well as majority instruments. For example, the uh, performance for the flute and the tabla are, is good. And also like, it's, it's not just predicting a bass and drums for everything. Um, yeah, so come by the poster for more uh, discussion on the results and, and the methodology. Thank you. Brings us to paper number E6, presented by? Estefania Cano. Jazz solo instrument classification with convolutional neural networks, source separation, and transfer learning. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to present this work conducted in Fraunhofer IGMT in Germany uh, with my colleagues Juan Sebastián Gómez and Jacob Abeza. So we've been interested in looking into jazz music for quite, quite some time. And what we wanted to do with this work was to uh, look into how far we could get with the classification of jazz solo instruments. But we wanted to push the classification a little bit further and see if we could go all the way to do classification on a subclass level. And what I mean by that is that we were not only interested in knowing whether the solo uh, instrument in the jazz uh, piece is a saxophone or a trumpet or a trombone, but we wanted to further find out whether it's, a, for example, a, so a soprano saxophone, an alto saxophone, or a baritone saxophone. And the way we um, approached the problem was to, by taking a state-of-the-art instrument recognition uh, model, which is based on a convolutional neural network, it's the model proposed by Han. Um, uh, and we conducted a series of experiments based on this model. The experiments are listed here on the screen. So the first thing that we did was uh, use harmonic percussive separation as a pre-processing stage. Then we used solo and accompaniment separation as a pre-processing stage. And finally, we use solo and accompaniment, but uh, also apply transfer learning to see how the classification would change. So as I said, the first experiment was using harmonic percussive separation. Uh, so instead of feeding the network with the original jazz track, we use the harmonic stream from the separation. The conclusion here is that a uh, classification improves a little bit. We can talk about the numbers and the results further in the poster. Then for the second experiment, uh, instead of feeding the neural network with the original jazz recording, we fed the network with the solo extracted um, with the uh, uh, separation algorithm. 
And again, here for two different data sets, the classification accuracy improves. Also the details we can uh, discuss in the poster. And so we went ahead and conducted a third experiment where we used the solo and accompaniment separation, but further applied transfer learning. The motivation for the transfer learning is that the training data available specifically for jazz music is not that great. So we trained the model from scratch uh, using the EARMAS data set, which we've uh, heard um, of often here. We um, applied different strategies for the transfer learning. Um, and the conclusions, the results also for this experiment were very similar. Um, as you can see down here for all the um, uh, network configurations that use the uh, separation um, tracks, uh, outperformed those who, that did not uh, use separation. So basically that were um, trained using the original jazz recordings. For this particular experiment, um, transfer learning did not improve the results, but we can also discuss the, why this could have happened when uh, we have more time in the posters. So thank you very much, and I'm poster number six. Paper E7, presented by? Catherine Kinnaird. Hi. Welcome. Aligned sub-hierarchies, a structure-based approach to the cover song task. All right, so um, I'm dealing with the, the cover song task. It's typically presented where we have some sort of signal, maybe a score or the audio, and then we post-process it in some way. Maybe we make a matrix representation, like a self-dissimilarity matrix. Um, and while we could try to do the cover song in these really fabulous tweed sort of patterning, uh, we usually post-process it in some way to extract some sort of structure um, or other features. In my case, I look at structure. Uh, we could build something like the aligned hierarchies, which shows us all possible decompositions of the song um, aligned on, on one common time axis. Um, but I, I actually take it a bit further. I assume in my work that I don't have access to the original signal. Um, now, the aligned hierarchies, well, they have a nice uh, classification metric. They can only make nuanced comparisons when our data is exactly the same number of beats or exactly the, uh, the same number of time steps, which in the cover song task is not really a great assumption to make. So, so what do we do? We could make a total comparison, um, something like the SNL diagrams presented yesterday, or we could do something that's a section-based comparison. Uh, which is the inspiration for the aligned subhierarchies, or ASH. So the aligned subhierarchies are the set of aligned hierarchies that are proper subsets of the original aligned hierarchies. Whew. So what does that all that mean? Um, it really means that we're making comparisons that um, are of the repeats that themselves have repetitive structure within them. Um, what's nice about the aligned sub-hierarchies is that they embed into a classification space with a natural notion of distance. And we'll talk about that distance in a second. But let's untangle this proper subset aligned hierarchy something, something, something. Um, so consider this toy example um, that has uh, a, a lot of repetition. And what we're looking for is we're looking for repeats that have smaller repeats within them. So for example, BAB, the Bs are repeated twice or ABA, the A's are repeated twice, um, or ABAB, where the B's are repeated twice, the A's are repeated twice, and so is the, the section AB. Now, the aligned, the aligned sub hierarchies requires that each element of the aligned sub hierarchies are aligned hierarchies themselves, which means that we need to remove any blocks within our pink block that um, do not repeat. Uh, so, that means that this pink block compresses down to just three rows, uh, one for the Bs that repeat twice, one for the As, and one for the Abs. So these can, we can use a natural comparison. Um, and before an aligned hierarchies or uh, the SNL diagrams, we have one object per song that we're making a comparison. Here, our comparison is an, is an aggregate of the set of objects within the ASH structure. Uh, so we're, we're building a list of objects and then comparing between those objects and aggregating that, to that total comparison. 
We've shown strong experimental results for the cover song task on Chopin mazurkas, where we had two versions of each score, one where the repeats were played uh, as Chopin intended, and the second where they were ignored. Um, but as the aligned sub hierarchies require repeats of the song to themselves be highly, uh, highly repetitive, this means that we had to remove some songs that did not have this highly repetitive structure. So please come to the poster to see how we dealt with real data and if any of these are repeats or uh, covers of each other. I'm E7. Paper E8 presented by Andreas Arzt. Audio to score alignments using transposition invariant features. Good morning. Um, this is joint work uh, with Stefan Lattner, a longtime colleague of ours in Linz and in Vienna, recently joined Paris, uh, Sony CSL in Paris. And the goal of this paper was uh, to look into using a gated autoencoder to compute features for the task, uh, transposition invariant features for the task of audio to score alignment, um, and especially have a look at their properties. So I will not explain to you what a gated autoencoder actually is and how it works. This is St Stefan's task. He deserves all the credit for this method, and he will present this later on in the same, sec uh, in the same session, which is paper E17. So I will only give a high level view on how we used it for this task. So we trained the gated autoencoder on 100 piano recordings, unsupervised fashion. The main idea was to try to learn a representation of the current frame in the audio based on the small local context. Mostly we used the last eight frames. And uh, we also forced uh, the autoencoder to represent the target frame while it's preceding frames in a relative way, which means we get transposition invariant features. Actually the mapping on top there are the features we use for the alignment task. So let's look, let's look at an example. We have here two bars of a Chopin, Chopin etude, and we have the same two bars transposed by three semitones. I know it looks really weird. Um, I apologize to all the musicians out there. Uh, we can, of course, create a MIDI from these scores. We can uh, render an audio version. We can compute a uh, consecutive transform, and then we can uh, slide our gated autoencoder over this sequence, over these sequences, and compute our features, which look like this. So on first glance, they look similar, and if we zoom in, we actually see they are similar, and most importantly, they are not transposed versions of each other, but the transposed score and the original score map to the same um, representation, in plus some noise, of course. So we use these features for audio to score alignment, um, which means we, uh, well, process the scores and the performances with our gated autoencoder, and we use the standard uh, dynamic time warping algorithm for the alignment. So I would like to stress again that the transposition invariance is in the features and not in the alignment method here. I have some results with me and there are more results on the paper, just to give you an idea. Uh, first, these are results on untransposed, so the normal scores and transposed scores, aligning a performance to a normal score and to a score which has random transpositions every 30 seconds, a very hard task. And the re alignment results are actually exactly the same. So our features uh, capture this perfectly, and we do not have to take care of these transpositions. We also compared these features to standard chroma features, and to our surprise, in many cases, they work better uh, than the chroma features, even on untransposed scores. So we throw away absolute or pitch information, actually, uh, and still they work better. On the downside, they are very sensitive to tempo changes, which is also to be expected because they depend on some local context. And this context changes depending on a tempo, so there are more notes in there or less notes in there. And this, of course, changes the feature representation. So this is a huge downside of these features at the moment. We also have some results on orchestral music, um, and they work more or less on, on this kind of music, but we need to look more into this. So I have more results on the poster, even more in the paper. Um, and uh, we will have our, paper, our posters over there, E8 and E17, and we would be happy to welcome you and discuss these features with you. Thank you.
Paper E9 presented by Chitrali Kagupta. Semi supervised lyrics and solo singing alignment. Hello, everyone. I'm Chitra Lekha from National University of Singapore. Let me start by asking a question. How many of you enjoy singing karaoke? Not bad. Did you know that the lyrics in karaoke um, are manually aligned with the song? You might wonder, how can we do this task automatically? With speech recognition? Well, singing obviously is different from speech in terms of pitch dynamics and the duration of the phonemes. Unfortunately, ASRs, or automatic speech recognizers, are trained only on large amounts of speech data, not on singing voice. Thus, there is a need to build ASR systems for singing. But to train such a system, a lot of lyrics annotated singing voice data is required, which is currently not available. Therefore, in this paper, we present a strategy to automatically build a lyrics-aligned singing voice data set. We then use this data set to iteratively adapt an ASR system to singing voice and show improvement in lyrics recognition. Our strategy for doing this was to first divide the audio into 10 second segments, then pass these segments through an ASR to get a decoded string of words. This sequence of words will contain errors because of speech and singing data mismatch. So we use the published lyrics as an external resource to correct these errors by a simple string alignment method. This results in a cleaner aligned lyrics annotation of the audio segment. To assess the quality of these annotations, we conducted a human listening test, which showed that 73% of these audio segments were correctly aligned to the lyrics. Next, we used 50 hours of this annotated data set to adapt a state-of-the-art ASR system to singing voice. Our baseline speech acoustic models are trained on Libri speech corpus. This system results in a word error rate of 72% on singing voice data. We then incorporated the speaker adaptive training method to adapt these models to singing voice. This resulted in a reduction of the word error rate to 37%. With the second iteration, the word error rate further reduced to 36%, and a duration modeling step on top of this has further reduced the word error rate to 29%. So our con contribution to the MIR community is the algorithm to obtain clean, lyrics annotations automatically. We have also kept the annotated training and test singing data sets of more than 50 hours open to the research community. Here's an example of an utterance from the data set along with its automatically obtained aligned lyrics. Becomes an ocean before you throw my heart back on the floor. Oh, baby, I reconsider. And finally, to check out our cool alignment demo, which is an application of this work, please drop by my poster. Thank you. Paper E10 is presented by? The Nod. Welcome. Concert Stitch. Organization and Synchronization of Crowdsourced Recordings. Um, still not on the screen. Okay. Um, so my work that I'm presenting today was done as a part of my master's project at Georgia Tech and my supervisor was Alexander Lurch. So basically what I observed is that in today's world there's a lot of audio recordings and videos that are uploaded to the internet, say Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, and they often don't get played or heard more than a few times. And I believe there is a lot of interesting content present in these recordings that can be used either for creative purposes or for practical purposes. For example, 
um, if you could create a platform where audience members or fans of a particular band can work together and create memorabilia of a concert that they attended together. Or more practically, for example, a venue or performers could analyze recordings that audience members are taking and kind of look at where audience members are focusing their cameras and which parts of the concert have the most number of recordings and get a sense of uh, where they're the most interesting and where they could improve either the stage venue or where they could make their performance more interesting. Um, and for the purpose of this research, um, we use two data sets. It's a, there's a real world data set and a synthetic data set. My main motivation came from the real world data set where there were five audience recordings of five songs from a Grateful Dead concert in 1977. And what I wanted to do was the ability to kind of merge these five audience recordings together and kind of recreate the entire concert. Um, and basically each song is about five minutes long and there's in total uh, 125 minutes of data and I manually annotated the alignments. So the algorithm can be divided into two steps. In the first step, I use a modified dynamic time warping algorithm which uh, provides an approximate alignment for a pair of recordings. And then I use a cross-correlation algorithm on the aligned part to try and uh, refine the alignment and ideally get close to a sample accurate alignment. So basically where the modification of the dynamic time warping algorithm is happening is typically you either have sequences that are completely aligned or you have a sequence that is a subsequence of the other one. But I also want the dynamic time warping algorithm to deal with the case where one sequence overlaps with another sequence. Um, details about that I'll explain at my poster. So I ran four experiments. So I tested uh, audio fingerprints and pitch chroma uh, for the purpose of similarity features in my uh, dynamic time warp warping algorithm. And I tested the dynamic time warping algorithm with uh, baseline uh, cross-correlation algorithms that were used in previous work in the same area. And then I did an analysis of the dynamic time warping algorithm where I changed the tolerance levels for the alignment and I analyzed how well it performs with respect to time stretching and pitch shifting. And finally, uh, I performed analysis on the improved alignment accuracy using the cross-correlation method on different features. Um, from the results in general, the dynamic time warping algorithm with audio fingerprints performs better as uh, we'd like. And in general, the improving alignment accuracy using cross-correlation did not audibly improve the results. Uh, please come to my poster for more information on all of this. Thank you. <laughs> Paper E11 is presented by Anna Leonakin. Welcome. A data driven approach to mid level perceptual musical feature modeling. Hello, my name is Anna Lienaki and I'm presenting a paper on modeling the mid-level perceptual uh, features with the data. So, uh, to begin with, what are the mid-level features? There are different definitions for low-level and high-level, which are normally not used in a very consistent way in the MIR community. But in general, uh, the low level is whatever is extracted from the spectrum. But I'm going to ratify this stuff uh, the perceptual way. So whatever uh, basic musical concept that doesn't need a long time to happen and is sort of objective as much as anything in the MIR can be objective is low level. And whatever um, in music that needs to consider every aspect of it to be defined is uh, the high level such as style or genre or mood. And mid level is in between and it's built from the low level concept and it applies structure and uh, includes relationships between the low-level concepts. So 
those are really important uh, uh, concepts on the mid-level because they help with high-level concept recognition and they might help us to break the glass ceiling in that. And they are important for music preference and music recommendations and also they uh, help with uh, search uh, in case when there is no other metadata such as in production music databases. So here are some examples. And there are algorithms to extract some of this. For some of this there is nothing. But um, how does it work normally? So let's take, uh, for instance, articulation. We um, will take a definition and then we will try to think of um, a way to, um, to come up with a metric or with a, uh, to, to create um, an algorithm for that. So for articulation, it's about the connectedness of sounds. So we take uh, inter-onset interval, for instance. But let's say now we have a, an ecological soundtrack and that's a um, um, uh, trance uh, song. And in that song there are uh, there is a track for drums, there is a track for other instruments, and each of the sounds has its own articulation. And uh, for each of those, we need uh, to extract interval onset interval, or maybe people are gonna focus on something else. So uh, when we try to redefine those concepts for this music, and especially to transfer these concepts created for classical music to other music, there are problems. So let's ask the people, the musicians. Uh, I'm going to collect the data in uh, a two-step way. First, I ask them to compare two excerpts and uh, to tell me which one is more melodious. Let's say, uh, oh, and I do that for seven other mid-level concepts. And here is an example. So this was a melodiousness scale. Now I can use that scale to get annotations on more excerpts and I can model the mid-level concepts from this data. And uh, here is a result of comparing uh, my algorithm with uh, some algorithms that already existed and for most of those concepts I get a better result uh, the data-driven way. So uh, come see me at, at my poster and I can explain more results where I got so many musicians and stuff like that. And it's poster number 11, thank you. Paper E12 is presented by... Jimena Arroyo Letelier. Welcome. Disambiguating music artists at scale with audiometric learning. Hi, uh, hi everybody. I'm uh, Jimena for this, from uh, this side. So, uh, did this ever happen to you? You go to our music stream services to uh, look for the music that artists you like and you go to the main page of this artist and you find some content that doesn't belong to, to it. Uh, so we are kind of confusing uh, unpleasant experience or maybe you are looking for an album and you don't find it because this album is in another artist page. Well, this is what we call uh, artist ambiguities and it uh, happens uh, when you have different artists that share the same name, which happen a lot, I think uh, for instance, Rafael, or when you have one artist with have, uh, which has several names, so Mrs. Spelling, so maybe different way to uh, name it. So uh, these, are, these are very common actually in large, uh, large uh, music um, in catalog. So you can talk to people in record labels or collective man management organizations. Uh, this is due primarily to uh, metadata related issues that I'm not going to discuss here, but if you come to the poster, we can, um, we can talk about that. Uh, so uh, what, what would you like to do if you work on MRI is try to solve these uh, ambiguities using audio. But uh, this is a difficult task because uh, in this catalog they are like, ever evolving and you already get a new artist. Uh, so a band is created, uh, for instance, every week and you cannot use a classification approach. So uh, um, as is uh, normally, uh, I guess, regularly uh, tackle this problem. And another thing that is, uh, is quite difficult is that you can have a high variability uh, across uh, recording from the same artist. This uh, can also happen. Or you can have acoustic similarities between recording from different artists. Uh, nevertheless, humans are normally uh, capable to, uh, to, to realize which albums belong to these artists. Um, so what we, what we propose uh, to solve this problem is to um, 
at least partially, is to uh, try to constru construct a representation uh, a space uh, directly from audio. So uh, the idea is to, to learn, uh, for instance, a parametric map, uh, like a convolutional or recurrent neural network, uh, that takes uh, low-level features, like instance, a uh, male spectrogram, and outputs points and, and in a low-dimensional uh, space. And uh, what we want is that uh, distance in this uh, low-dimensional space correspond with artist membership. And if you, if you manage to do that, where well, you are more or less solve your problem because then you can use some uh, clustering algorithm or supervised clustering algorithm and to solve the deal with this. And we think this is an important task uh, because it's uh, like a real uh, uh, life uh, scenario when actually you can deal with um, this artists you have not seen before or uh, when you don't, we don't know how many artists, different artists are uh, with, uh, with the same name. So uh, we did a... Uh, we did uh, one uh, approach to this, which is this uh, metric learning, because actually metric learning, what you do is really like shape the, uh, the system uh, as we want, and you use this kind of hinge loss, which is here. We, what we does is to try to bring actually uh, close uh, the points in the space that come from recording from the same artist, and to push uh, away the points in the space that come from different artists, which is uh, exactly what we want. So. Um, we did some experiments, and we compared ourselves with another system that is able to extract uh, representations from this uh, paper from Park. And uh, we did a lot of experiments, different database, and that's uh, the overall result is actually uh, uh, you can, you are, the system are able to, um, to distinguish between artists that share the same name, and that depending on the, the training condition, one another actually works better. And what we also uh, try to do is to add more information when you use the, uh, our proposition of metric uh, learning. Uh, for instance, if you, you, you know the genre of the artist, you can try to train your system in such a way that um, two artists that show the, 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 the same genre are well separate, uh, because actually this is the hardest case. And we, we did some results that uh, to show that this information uh, helps uh, in the learning process. And we also do... Uh, Come to the poster. Paper E13 is presented by Simon Waloszek. Welcome. The title is Drifting Down the Scale Dynamic Time Warping in the Presence of Pitch, Drift, and Transpositions. So, um, hello, everyone. Um, let me start by telling you about one of our recent projects where we had to align a large variety of different songs to the corresponding uh, symbolic scores. And while that went rather smoothly for most parts, uh, we had one particular genre that gave us a hard time, and that was a cappella singing. So if you're looking at instrumental recordings, uh, you can usually safely assume that the overall tuning stays the same for the entire piece. This assumption doesn't really hold for a cappella music because most singers don't have or are not gifted with perfect pitch, so they have minor intonation inaccuracies that might sum up to substantial pitch drift in the long run. So unfortunately, if the notes are slightly off, which happens when the pitch drifts, of course, um, regular chroma features tend to show a poor selectivity between adjacent semitones. So one, night, one note might simply fall between two filter bins, and this makes the resulting chromograms kind of fuzzy, as you can see on the left side for a sign sweep. Um, that's not very useful if you want to do alignment of choir music. So what we did is added, we added tuning estimation for every single feature, and we got these sharp uh, chromograms that you could work with. So each feature is computed by uh, taking three bins for each semitone in the frequency domain, obtained by a constant Q transform, and then we sum up the lower parts. Uh, okay, weird animation. Uh, we sum up the lower parts of each trio, and we do the same for the other two parts. Um, using these values, uh, we do parabolic peak estimation and get the approximate tuning deviation of the current feature so we can compute our sharp chromogram or rather these uh, harmonic pitch class grams that makes us happy. Um, yeah, chroma-like features are generally pretty nice if you want to transpose music because all you have to do is simply shift it up or down like in this case and there's a transposition and if you do it a couple more times, uh, exactly 11 times, um, you get every possible transposition, uh, every transposition, and if you stack that up, you get kind of like a three-dimensional feature. Uh, so now let's go back to dynamic time warping. Um, the schoolbook version works like this. You have two dimensions, 
one for the audio, one for the symbolic score, and you are basically restricted to uh, these three steps on the right, and as you can see, there are variants, I know, but this is like the schoolbook version of it. So our feature computation uh, added a third dimension to this, uh, and the, you know, now the third axis on the cost matrix denotes the current transposition offset in relation to the written pitch of the score. So if our pitch drift sums up to more than half a semitone, we just take one step along this new t-axis and we are right on track again. So the path computation gets a little bit more complicated in terms of space and time in that way, but we still are able now to uh, track the transposition changes over time. And as a side note, um, this generally is still compatible with a lot of variations like global path constraints or varying step sizes, et cetera. So, uh, you can use your old methods pretty nicely. So the evaluation showed that this approach indeed solved our problem of pitch drift and more generally speaking of transposition changes over time. And it even improved the results for music without any transposition or pitch drift at all. So, uh, well, it's compared to regular chroma features and the regular dynamic time warping without any magic. So, and just to make sure we're not trying to beat state of the art in audio to score alignment in any way, this was just a specific obstacle that we tried to overcome in our task. Um, yeah, that's it. Like everyone else, uh, we have a poster, so please come by and let's talk. Thank you. Paper E14 is presented by Jodie Bunt. Welcome. End-to-end -end learning for music audio tagging at scale. Okay, um, yeah, so our work is about end-to-end -end learning, this meaning that I'll be discussing deep, deep learning models for the task of music audio tagging. And basically the novelty of our work is that we'll be doing this at scale. This means that besides evaluating our models, uh, our models against these two publicly available data sets, the million song uh, data set, which is the biggest uh, publicly available data set out there and the Magna Taga Tune, We'll be also evaluating our models against uh, a, a private data set of one million training songs, okay? Uh, and this actually will allow us to, to answer this question, that is, which deep learning models perform the best at scale? And in order to answer that, uh, we'll be discussing two models. And here, the main idea is that these models are based on two opposite design strategies, okay? One is based on processing the waveform, and the main idea of this model is to try to minimize the assumptions we do when we design this model. That's the reason why we use uh, the raw signal as it is, and we use a generic CNN architecture for audio. The architecture looks like that. It's basically the waveform, and then we process it with a, a stack, a deep stack of, of very small filters. Uh, and then, so remember we said that we want to use two architectures that are based on opposite design strategies, the other one heavily relies on domain knowledge for its design, okay? So basically, uh, we have a model that processes spectrograms, and the architecture we use is specifically designed uh, to capture the, 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 the parts of the signal that are, are important for music. So basically, we know, for example, that for music is important timbral and temporal features, and we design a CNN that is able uh, to capture these local stationarities. Uh, so basically, these are the two models that now we'll be comparing, right? The waveform one, doing minimal assumptions over which is the nature of the problem, and the uh, spectrum one that uh, heavily relies on the main knowledge for its design. So now the question is, well, which of these models can better uh, take advantage of all this training data we have available, right? So let's see the results. Uh, for the publicly available data sets, we see that the spectrum models perform better than waveform-based ones, yeah, this is nothing new, right? So if you have to design a deep learning model, most of us would probably be using spectrograms. They seem to work better in our publicly available data sets. But, uh, and here comes the interesting result. Um, yeah, when we have more training data, waveform models can perform better than spectrum-based ones. And here, kind of the, the intuition we have is that since these waveform-based models, uh, or this one specifically, kind of, uh, does, does no strong assumptions over which is the nature of the problem. In a way, this is not constraining too much the solution space, 
and maybe this can better exploit all this training data available. Of course, this is, you know, quick idea. Now come to the poster if you want and we can better discuss this. Um, yeah, that's mostly it. So if you want, uh, we have a demo online, you can check it. Uh, and also you have code for uh, seeing or reading the, the models. Of course, I could not go through it. So here you have more details. So thank you very much. Paper E15 is presented by Romain Quint. Welcome. Audio-based disambiguation of music genre tags. Uh, well, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. So I will present you our work about uh, disambiguating uh, music genre tags. So as you can see, in Deezer, we don't like very much ambiguities, and we try to disambiguate everything. So this is a joint work uh, with Remena Royal Atelier and uh, Manuel Moussadam. So uh, if you want to do genre uh, classification, there is a lot of uh, annotated data in the wild. So uh, the Free Music Archive uh, data set, MIMI data set, so on. A lot, a lot of data. And so if you have a uh, neural network uh, deep enough, like uh, Jordi presented, you're very happy. You can do uh, genre classification. Well. The problem is that uh, every data set speaks uh, its own language. So if you look closely at, uh, at how a data set describes genre, represents genre, you can see that for uh, the Free Music Archive data set, for, uh, for instance, you have a set of tags. You have a hierarchy of tags. So this is a hierarchy with a, a different level of genre and subgenre. And if you look at Discogs, it's a different set of tags, different uh, hierarchy. Uh, well, Mew Mew, another one. Google Audio Set, another one, and so on and so forth. So, well, this is a problem because each data set has its own set of tags, own organization of tags, and, well, usually the definition of tags is not explicit, so it's very hard to translate from a data set to another. We really lack uh, universal representation for music genre. So uh, besides that, within data sets, you may have also trouble uh, due to the music genre representation. You may have duplication. Sometimes you have uh, the same concept that is represented by uh, several tags. Sometimes you have polysemy, meaning that the same tag is used to represent different concepts. You may have some taxonomy or ontology design limitation, uh, which uh, make difficult to relate tag, uh, genre tags inside the data set uh, together, and also you can simply have missing tags and missing representation. So globally, we are not very satisfied with that because uh, we, we lack uh, common universal representation without all these issues. So how co could we build such a representation? So one approach would be to uh, build an expert level ontology and try to match every tags or every, of every data set into it. Well, it's not very easy to do. It's costly and difficult. And actually, it has been done a lot of time. Like, mostly every data set has done it once, and they don't agree on that. And besides that, matching tags uh, within an ontology is not trivial, because we uh, generally lack an explicit definition of this tag. So what, what can we do else? Uh, we can use a data-driven approach using the tag distribution and try to relate tags with their co-occurrency. So if a tag co-occurs co with another, they, uh, yeah, they are somehow related. So for that, uh, you need actually to have co-occurrencies. And sometimes uh, the data set does not overlap, so you don't have annotation in music genre in both data sets. So what can we do then? So the only media that is common uh, to all data sets is actually audio, so we propose to use it. So in this uh, work, uh, we presented uh, the construction of a music genre representation uh, for tags, which is based on the confusion that make an audio-based classifier uh, that try to predict genre. And we show that with this, pre uh, this representation of tags, you can uh, learn a, a hierarchy of genre tags, spot duplicates, or translate, uh, translate genre tags from uh, one database uh, to another. Thank you, and come and see our poster.
Paper E16 is presented by Injil Nol. Welcome. Learning domain adaptive latent representations of music signals using variational autoencoders. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for the introduction. My name is Injun Lo, and from ADMS in Taiwan. So, as music information research usually involves interaction between different domains of modalities, our goal in this work is to um, devise a framework that can learn and extract the feature representation shared across different domains. But why bother? So, consider the task of seeing voice alignment in which we align the same voice to its um, polyphonic version. One way to get this right, um, in terms of good ac um, alignment accuracy, is to extract the features that are shared between the two domains, So, which matches our goal in this paper. So we apply our, uh, our um, framework and evaluate the, the model um, on the problem of same voice alignment, also the um, same voice separation. So specifically, our architecture include uh, a variation auto encoder to model the source domain data. And after training, we can discard the decoder and also fix the model parameters and the derived uh, latent variables. And then we can train the other target encoder to model the target domain data, which the, uh, the target is to learn the latent representations to guide the training of the target encoder. Notice that we can do this because we have the paired input of the same musical events, which in this example is the singing voice and its polyphonic version. We also um, use the weight transfer to achieve better performance. So this is the first application that we use to evaluate our model, um, in which we align the artificially distorted uh, source domain data and to the untouched target domain data. So we use the dynamic time warping to align the derived um, feature representation Z and Z star. So the result shows that um, in the same voice alignment, our proposed feature representation outperformed the baseline feature, which is the male capture coefficient uh, across all the condition of distortion settings. Furthermore, we also apply our model um, to audio uh, to media alignment which also shows the similar result. Um, last but not least, we used it to um, evaluate with the problem of scene voice separation. So building on the top of the um, baseline architecture, which is the denoising autoencoder on the, on the bottom part of the slide, takes the input of the polyphonic version of the singing and output the estimated singing source. And we just use the same architecture, the trained autoencoder, and um, to, gu to guide the training process of the denoising autoencoder. And the result also shows that um, by using both weight transfer and regularization with the mean square error, we can yield the best performance in terms of SDR and NSDR. So if you want to know more about the missing information, um, please come to my poster at um, number 16. Thank you very much. That brings us to the last presentation of the session, number E17, presented by Stefan Lattner. Welcome. Learning interval representations from polyphonic music sequences. Hi, I'm Stefan Lattner from Sony CSL Paris, um, and most of this work has been done at the JKU in Linz. So meanwhile, this is the third talk on that model and or on these representations um, the model can learn. Um, the <coughs> gated autoencoder. I will um, show you just um, yet another application for these features the model can learn, um, which is finding repetitions in um, or transposed repetitions in music. So again, the basic idea is you can input musical sequences in, in this model when it's trained and it projects these sequences into a relative um, pitch representation, which is transposition invariant. And for this task, um, I trained the model on two different data sets, like two instances of this model, 
Um, one is polyphonic symbolic music in piano roll representation, and um, the other one is a constant cue representation of audio. And here is an example of such a um, polyphonic sequence um, with um, diatonically transposed repetitions in there. And if we project the sequence into the um, uh, latent space of this model, we can then just um, compute the self-similarity matrix on these uh, features. And if we detect, um, if we see here these nice red diagonals which indicate that there are repetitions in music. And if we then just detect these diagonals, we basically just detect our um, repeated um, um, themes or sections. Um, we applied um, this method to the data set the Myrex task discover of repeated themes and sections. And we found for audio that, it, that we could Im, um, prove the state of the art. So the, the left arrow points at the F score of our model here. And uh, the other arrow um, for symbolic music, we could not quite improve the state of the art. I think uh, that's um, what we call our model is competitive. So, um, but uh, note that uh, at least it's, very, it's a very simple method. So um, we just search for diagonals in a self-similarity matrix. Um, the Markov oracle, which holds the, the best score here, um, is about 30 times slower than our model. So to wrap up, actually, our three talks, um, we showed that um, these features are very in, um, interesting features for different tasks, um, for discovery of repeated themes and sections. Uh, Andreas showed you before that um, we can use it for transposition invariant alignment um, of audio to scores. And uh, on Monday, I showed a repetitive, uh, <laughs> a recurrent version of this model and showed that it can learn structure in music and um, also transposed repetition. And I want to invite all of you to think about how these features may um, contribute or benefit your MIR task, because these features are really um, uh, decreasing the sparsity of the data, maybe um, leading to more gener generalization of the model and maybe to smaller model sizes. Um, you can just transform your data into these features and then perform your operations on this. So we could use it for different kinds of classification tasks on, on music, for transposition variant cover sound detection, speech recognition, variable humming, recommender systems, and so on. And before we saw um, that pitch drift is a problem in a cappella alignment, so actually with these features you might solve this problem directly. Um, the code is online, at least for audio. Um, I'm happy to also do a um, symbolic version of it and uh, also pre-trained weights so you can just transform your audio into these features. For more questions, visit me at my poster. Thank you. So that's the final speech of this oral session E. Do not forget to vote for the best oral presentation. Let's have a round of applause for all 17 speakers. And a round of applause for the assistants that have helped run this session so smoothly. And before you get up, we have an announcement to make. OK, so I'm going to make a short announcement. And I will maybe redo it um, this afternoon for a tonight uh, social event. So as you know, it's a boat cruise on Seine River. And uh, since it's a boat cruise, we have to board in the boat. And uh, when the boat leaves, nobody can board anymore, of course. So which means that we have to be very strict on the timing. And uh, uh, the reason for that uh, is that it's a big boat. Actually, I think it's the largest boat that you can have to cruise on the Seine River in Paris. Uh, but despite that, we will we are sold out, sold out, and so we'll be, it will be fully. Uh, it will be a, uh, the boat will be full. So the t the boarding time, as it's printed in the program, it's eight, but you can be there a little bit in advance. No problem. The weather is very nice, and at that time it will be even not chilly. On the boat, it may be a little bit chilly uh, later on, on the night, but at eight it should be okay. 
so be a little bit before eight, and uh, we will aim to uh, to finish the boarding by 8.45. Uh, and uh, the reason is because the regulations are pretty strict for big boats in, in Paris, and we will have a specific time to leave the quay. And if we do not leave the quay at this specific time, we will have to wait one, one hour at the quay before being able to leave again the quay. Uh, so please be uh, on time. It's not very far. You can take line six to go, uh, the subway line six to go there, and then it's a very short walk. It's very close to the Eiffel Tower. Not very far. I think it's maybe half an hour from here. Uh, so, uh, but don't arrive too late. Um, the other thing I would like to say that I have some question in the program. It's, re it's written that it's on, the boat is on until 2 a.m. It's true. You will be able to stay on the boat until 2 a.m. But what is not true is that you, 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 will, you will not have to stay until 2 a.m. <laughs> so uh, what, what, what its plan is that the boat will leave the quay and then we will make a two hour and a half cruise on the Seine River and go back to the quay. So that it means that uh, it, we should be back at the quay around maybe 11.30 or so, and you will be able to leave the boat at that time. But for those who want to, to uh, benefit from the jam session, the jam session will be on until 2 a.m. And uh, you can stay on the boat or you can leave the boat. Uh, it's up to you. Okay, that's my short announcement. So, um, as usual, we, we're now moving to the coffee break, and then we will have the poster sessions, as usual. I will ask the first three rows to, to, to move to another seat. And the next presentation will be the keynote at 1.30, which is uh, Rebecca Fibrink, which will uh, talk to us about uh, interactive machine learning. <laughs>